Tonight on CFDKA TV News, BC's Minister of Finance gave her thoughts on some subjects. Kinemat opened their first McDonald's restaurant, and a Vancouver Island woman won big with Lotto Max. Northwest BC's only television news team. We are CFTK TV News. Good evening, I'm Kale Maslin, and here's what's making news in the Northwest and beyond today. An interview done recently got the thoughts of BC's Minister of Finance on a few different subjects and some more information on them as well. Last week, BC's Finance Minister, Katrin Conroy, visited Terrace mainly to give a speech at the opening of a brand new licensed childcare space located at the city of Terrace's sportsplex. But in a later interview, she also spoke a bit about some other subjects, namely on the implementation of a national pharmacare plan and how it will affect BC. It can only help us. Um, we already are bringing in a lot more drugs, a lot more affordability. We, last, last year's budget, we brought in free um, uh, prescription contraception, contraception, and that'll be part of the federal program. So I believe that'll help us with, with costs, and uh, we can only help us working together with the federal government. Also part of the aforementioned plan, is that medication for diabetes will be brought in as well, considering how expensive it can get. BC is confirmed to be part of the program, and Conroy said that BC Health Minister Adrian Dix is quite excited about that fact. But medical-based partnerships are seemingly not the only partnership that BC is seeking to work with the federal government on. Well, we are looking at a partnership with the federal government when it comes to housing. We just uh, that was just announced uh, last week, I believe, and and look, especially looking at um, affordable housing, but also rental, making sure that there's a good quality rental stock, affordable rental stock in the province, but also looking towards those forever homes for people, and that's very much a part of our housing program. Even with these comments, it's not currently clear if more agreements between the two parties on other subjects could happen as well. For CFTK TV News, I'm Kale Maslin. This past Friday saw the grand opening of what is officially the first ever McDonald's restaurant to be located in Kinemat. It was an opening that saw a big ribbon cutting ceremony where it was Kinemat's Mayor Phil Kermuth that had the honor of being the one to cut the ribbon and Heisman Chief Crystal Smith attended as well. Pure Country and Bounce Radio will also make a live on location appearance this Friday to celebrate its opening. This is the same building that also recently made the choice to not cut down a stand of trees that is blocking a view of their Golden Arches sign on Highway 37. While the establishment did get permission from the Kinemat Council to take down the trees, there was quite a bit of blowback from local residents, so the trees will remain put. Reports have come out about the City of Terrace's firefighters needing to respond quickly to a fire that popped up just after 1 p.m. on March 7th. This fire is said to have appeared in one of the four houses that is located on the 4,500 block of Lazelle behind St. Matthew's Anglican Church. The fire also showed up not long after Terrace's RCMP appeared at what seems to be the same set of houses in order to conduct a raid on one of the neighboring houses. Luckily, the firefighters were able to act quick and managed to contain the blaze before it got wildly out of control. Over the past several months or so, the Terrace RCMP were investigating several different mischief incidents where glue was put on the locks of businesses in downtown Terrace. These incidents led to the respective businesses suffering thousands of dollars in damages, and some even had their windows smashed by the so-called glue bandit. But the Terrace General Investigation Section have since compiled enough evidence to identify a suspect and finally arrest them. The local RCMP will submit their investigation findings to BC's Prosecution Services at a later time, and since they have thanked local community members who helped out with the investigation. Coming up next, the BC government will be coming down harsher on those who damage overpasses. Welcome back. Dozens of overpass crashes in recent years have cost taxpayers millions of dollars, but none of the previous fines come close to paying for the damage. And as the province has announced, a major ramp up of the penalties up to $100,000. And as CTV's Michelle Bernardo reports, drivers who damage crucial infrastructure could even find themselves in prison. The number of overpass strikes by commercial vehicles in BC, troubling. There's been 35 since late 2021, costing millions in provincial highway repairs. Let me be clear, these crashes need to stop. 
Now the province plans changes that would allow courts to impose fines for as much as $100,000 as well as imprisonment of up to 18 months for violations. The penalties are the highest in Canada. Nobody sets out to hit an overpass. Uh, what this does is sends the message to say you need to be more diligent. You need to pay attention to what you're doing. Companies could also be held liable. It really depends on the facts that are uncovered uh, around uh, a driver responsibility uh, and or a poor safety culture that uh, is the responsibility of a company. But critics argue stiffer penalties aren't the answer, saying the problem lies with too many inexperienced drivers, dispatchers and companies in B.C. I don't think jail time and or fines of, of that uh, magnitude is going to change anything. I think what's happened is there are simply accidents and and. I think the government can do a lot more in terms of signage and just education in general. To support drivers through this change, we're developing training material that provides commercial drivers guidance. The NDP government has previously taken steps to crack down on repeat offenders. Last December, Shohan Freight Forwarders was involved in an overpass strike, the sixth one in the past two years, and had its safety certificate cancelled. The company told CTV it's appealing that under the Motor Vehicle Act. With respect to the proposed stiffer penalties, a company spokesperson wrote, we support any steps the government can take to hold commercial drivers accountable when these accidents occur rather than punishing an entire fleet or carrier. The province is also looking at the feasibility of making dash cameras mandatory for commercial vehicles, something the minister thinks is a good idea, but consultations are ongoing. The province hoping more accountability from the industry will make highways safer. Michelle Brunoro, CTV News, Langley. Another B.C. community is seeking relief from the short-term rental rules coming into effect this spring. Victoria's mayor says that she wants the city to have one more summer, a major tourism season, before the laws officially kick in. CTV's Rob Buffum is more. Two bedroom, two bath. Nancy Payne is winding down her business that manages short-term rentals, bracing for rule changes coming soon. Today, though, she learned Victoria's mayor is trying to persuade the province to hold off on the changes until the fall. I feel that the government has already killed the business, so this just feels like death by a thousand paper cuts. As of May 1st, for many communities, short-term rentals will only be allowed at a primary residence. Mayor Oltos supports the restrictions but thinks businesses like Payne's should have more time to prepare and the tourism industry should get to enjoy one more strong summer. We're approaching that high season in Victoria, being the summer of course. Uh, the idea was that to allow these folks uh, one last high season before they become uh, long-term housing providers. I think it gives more time to tourism, it gives more time to the individual property owners, it gives, it's going to give more time for businesses in our community to adjust to these changes. The housing minister today said they've had plenty of time and Victoria is not getting a break on the rules. People are struggling for housing in our community right now. There's people struggling in Victoria right now to get access to housing. And most people would say, why are we taking so long to do this? But Victoria is just the latest community to press for relief. Parksville repeatedly sought a full exemption, citing tourism impacts. And a group from across BC that signed a petition with 10,000 names brought their protest to the legislature last week. We represent people all across British Columbia. Meanwhile, 14 resort communities, including Tofino, and communities with a population less than 10,000 can apply to opt into the short-term restrictions. Tofino votes tonight whether it will do just that, as different communities grapple with major changes to housing and tourism looming just six weeks away. Robert Buffum, CTV News. A Vancouver Island woman has a few extra dollars in her pocket, to say the least, after a big Lotto Max win. The $18 million payout comes after years of buying tickets to no avail. CTV's Ben Nesbitt has the story. Sharon Fraser has played the lottery for years, playing the same numbers on every ticket. And despite the lack of success, she says she had a feeling this day was coming. It's a funny thing, I, I uh, was thinking about my grandfather who played lotteries all his life and uh, a few weeks ago I was driving by a sign and I kind of thought, you know, I've been playing a lot of years, maybe it's my turn. Turns out it was, but at first Fraser says she did not believe it, thinking she had just won a free play, but after confirming with BC Lottery, it all hit. 
I was super emotional. I, I really all started crying because, I, you know, it's kind of been years and years of buying tickets. Fraser is retired and lives on a sailboat with her husband. She says she plans to buy a property and a new car. The new chunk of money will also provide security for her kids. You, you, you dream about this kind of a situation and, and uh, it came true. The dream came true. But for now, she'll be celebrating her win at sea, taking some time away from the Pacific Northwest, sailing south to chase the sun. Ben Nesbitt, CTV News, Vancouver. Turning to tonight's weather, the north coast is likely to deal with periods of rain and a low of 7 degrees. The Terrace Kitimat area is supposed to see rain as well, with the low is at 4 degrees. And the Bulkley Valley and Lakes District is set to have a chance of showers, with their low at 3 degrees. On the north coast, their next week or so should begin with rain, but then get a bit sunnier afterwards, albeit with some clouds remaining and a high moving from 8 to 13 degrees. In the Terrace Kitimat area, the week for them will consist of chances of rain for a bit before becoming a mix of sun and cloud combo, with the high shifting between 6 and 14 degrees. And in the Bulkley Valley and Lakes District, the upcoming week will have mostly sunny and cloudy days, but with some straight up sunny days as well, while the high bounces from 11 to 14 degrees. Checking out the highways now, visit Drive BC for the latest and up-to-date conditions. It is always drive safe out there. On Highway 16, there is slippery sections, utility work, bridge maintenance, and a new traffic signal being installed. Plus, the Usk Ferry is out of service and the cable car is in effect. Highway 37 has some slippery sections too, some more slippery sections on the Nishka Highway, and the Telegraph Creek Road has compact snow and slippery sections of its own. And this is what the roads were looking like this afternoon around the region for the view of the province's highway cams. Still to come, a man who spoke out against an airline company has suddenly died. Welcome back. After a series of dangerous mishaps involving Boeing planes, a whistleblower against the company has been found dead. Authorities believe the former employee died by suicide only months before his retaliation lawsuit would go to trial. NBC's Tom Costello reports. This morning, police in Charleston, South Carolina, tell NBC News they are aware of the death of a former Boeing employee turned whistleblower. 62-year-old John Barnett found dead on Friday from what the coroner calls an apparent self-inflicted gunshot wound. So this is my uh, retirement plaque. Barnett retired from Boeing in 2017 after working as a quality manager for more than 30 years. Since his departure, he has taken legal action against the company, claiming he was retaliated against for raising safety issues internally, issues that Boeing denied at the time. Back in 2019, Barnett sat down with Today describing a haphazard safety culture at Boeing. From day one, it's just all been about schedule and hurry up and just get it done, push the planes out, we're behind schedule. You know, we don't have time to, to worry about issues that y'all bring up. In 2017, the FAA released a review upholding many of Barnett's concerns. With regards to his sudden death, the company released a statement writing, we are saddened by Mr. Barnett's passing and our thoughts are with his family and friends. Production standards at Boeing are under intense scrutiny following a series of troubling incidents involving Boeing planes. The Justice Department has launched a criminal investigation into Boeing following the blowout door plug on a 787 MAX 9 in January. The NTSB determined the plane left the Boeing plant without critical bolts that hold the plug in place. A scathing new FAA audit also found Boeing failed to comply with its own quality control procedures. We're working with Boeing and uh, demanding that they come up with a very detailed plan within the next 90 days uh, to fix the quality issues that are out there. 
Haiti's unelected and exiled president has promised to resign. Recently, there was an urgent meeting of Caribbean leaders in Jamaica on how to deal with the crisis with leaders from Canada, the U.S., and France in attendance. Even still, roving gangs wield power, and the government is currently in disarray there. CTV's Genevieve Boschaman has more. With violence and chaos reigning in Haiti, embattled Prime Minister Ariel Henry announced he would step down leaving the post he's held since 2021, since the former president's assassination. This in a late night video address from exile. Haiti besoin la paix. He said the country needed peace and asked Haitians to remain calm. We acknowledge the resignation of Prime Minister Ariel Henry. At the closing conference of a high level meeting on Haiti's progress, leaders said a transition council would be appointed along with an interim prime minister. This just a few hours after a telephone meeting between Henri and Canada's Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau. Foreign Affairs Minister Mélanie Joly issued a statement today saying Canada welcomed the news of a political agreement among Haitian stakeholders. As heavily armed gangs tightened their grip on the country, fear of an all-out civil war mount, Canada has warned citizens in the country to shelter in place. The threat of widespread famine, water running out, and an epidemic continues to rise. Food is depleting fast, so I don't know what will happen for the next uh, two weeks in terms of food, but also in terms of medication. Quebec's large Haitian diaspora is growing increasingly concerned about the situation on the ground. And people talking, you know, calling the family here and say, please, please help us. So this is how we feel, our heart in Haiti and our body in Canada. Leaders in Montreal called for the Canadian government to take on a leadership role to ensure Haitian people are at the heart of political decisions. A contingent of a thousand police officers from Kenya was expected to head to the country, but that deal is now on hold until there's a new temporary government in place. Geneviève Beauchemin, CTV News, Montreal. And now we turn our attention to the stock markets. The Canadian dollar is up 15 tenths of a cent, the price of gold is up $14.70, oil is up $2.16, natural gas is down 6 cents, aluminum is up $6, in Toronto the TSX is up 139.09 points, the Venture Index is up 1.51, in New York the Dow Jones is up 37.83, and Nasdaq is down 87.87. Still ahead, a high school student recently had an experience he'll likely never forget. Welcome back. A Vancouver high school student who wants to represent Canada at the Paralympics has just returned from a volleyball trip to Las Vegas. That's where he met players from one of his favorite teams, the Vancouver Canucks, and their coach Rick Tockett. CTV St. John Alexander has more. We first met Matteo Pelizzari just as he was about to board a flight. Where are you going to today? Vegas. The 17-year-old struck us as confident, kind, and highly motivated. An avid hockey fan who's been playing on the ice since he's been four and now wants to represent Canada. Paralympics aren't easily attainable, um, but, you know, I feel like I can see the path ahead of me now, and that's really exciting, as long as I can put in the work to get there. You see, when he was just a year old, Mateo's parents were faced with what must have been a very difficult choice. I was missing a bone in both of my legs, and uh, my feet were kind of deformed, so they chose to amputate my legs. When we came out of the doctor's office, we both looked at each other and said, that's the decision that we have to do. Not doing so might have meant years of uncertainty, surgeries, and he may have never walked. But now, thanks to a competition by the NHL and Air Canada, he's on his way to see the Canucks on the road. Winners, we're told, are exceptional people. They have to be nominated. He's pretty inspirational to many people, so we thought, you know, he has a good story to share, so let's share it. Five days after he boarded that flight... It was amazing, yeah, no, it was, it was just as incredible as I thought it was going to be. I got to fist bump most of the guys. I got to... Um, Signatures. But Mateo says the highlight, without a doubt, was meeting the coach. Mateo. Mateo. Um, I, I played for the National Terra team. Oh, nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, yeah. So, wow. Yeah. The way he spoke and the way he was like, so, and he listened so intently and he was just so like genuine. Um, that was like, I really appreciate that. And that was really cool. The plan now? Share that advice with his teammates. Use it off and on the ice. As for that dream of playing for Canada, 
The Paralympic team will be built closer to the Games in 2026, but when Matteo was only 15 years old, he'd already made it on the national team. Sinjin Alexander, CTV News, Vancouver. BC has begun funding inside the province of Mido treatment for some types of leukemia in addition to lymphoma. Health Minister Adrian Dix has stated that the CAR-T therapies aimed at cases where chemotherapy and radiation have not typically been successful. In previous times, patients had to be sent outside of the province for therapy, but now 20 spaces for adults and 5 for children have been made available this year at both the Vancouver General Hospital and BC Children's Hospital. The therapy involves collecting a patient's white blood cells and genetically engineering them to then recognize and kill cancer cells. The BC Green Party says the provincial government should ban advertising of fossil fuels as part of the fight against climate change. The Green Safe Fossil Fuel ad should be banned for ads like cigarettes due to the impacts on human health caused by fossil fuel pollution. The party says it's following the lead of the Canadian Association of Physicians for the Environment in calling for the ban. Green leader Sonia Furstenau says fossil fuel ads are pervasive around BC on public transit, in newspapers, and on social media, adding that the provincial NDP is making misleading claims about the benefits of liquefied natural gas. That's all of our news for now. From everyone at CFDK TV News, I'm Kale Maslin. Thanks for watching.